stimulate collective action so that we actually work together in consortia across countries. And that means we just have to sit through these planning meetings and strategy sessions. So, and but this is your, the last one. And uh, uh, the idea of uh, this, this last discussion is really to say, okay, we've heard the science, we've talked about many of the issues. Now, what can we do together? People in this room or people you know that you can represent, uh, what, what, what will we do in HCA Asia? Right? And make a plan for going forward. So, um, and the idea of this session is to have it as, uh, as participatory as possible so that, you know, we try to bring in people in this room to um, contribute to new projects. So, um, I, I, I lead with the first question and I, and I hope it will be everyone in this, this room addressing that. It's like, how can we increase representation of Asian data in HCA? Or maybe make, maybe make it more pointed. What are you going to do to increase representation of uh, Asian data in, in HCA? So it's uh, also related to the, the one topic that we raised in the, the breakout session about uh, the outreach. So we should have uh, the, uh, the permanent the website that represents hum human cellular address Asia in the many languages as, as possible. Because that's very important to reach out to the, the funding source of each country and other things. And also share the, the information throughout the, all the countries uh, in each language. So I think that we can instantly do. So, sorry, could you introduce yourself also? Uh, uh, my name is Jun Seida from Riken, okay. Japan. So, so you're suggesting uh, data sharing? For HCA Asia? Yeah. Excellent suggestion. Yeah. Multilingual, right? For, for each government. For each government. <laughs> exactly, exactly. exactly. And, and to the public. So I think it goes back to the education and encouraging the donors to understand the value of data sharing and, and genetics. Um, and that has to be in their, in their own native language. And yes, HCA. May, a lot of people may think it's an American you know, organization, but it's, it's not. It's truly global. So we should have a, a communication for every country. Uh, maybe, yeah, for Asia, uh, may, maybe you could also be the second tier, but I think even having the global HCA to be in the local language, I think, is important. Yeah. Is, it, is the white paper only in English so far? The big white paper is only in English, right? Okay, this is something. Yeah, we, you're right. I mean, you could translate the white paper in the local language. But again, maybe a more abridged form, because I don't think anyone reads white papers. Um, <laughs> some do. So, so, so how to um, summarize the, the mission and vision of HCA, HCA Asia, um, in a graphic, even this was talked about in the genetic session, cartoon or illustration in, in languages that people would understand. Even videos could also work. Uh, but website could be a very start, initial starting point, uh, which can be relatively quick and, and, and be done. Yeah. Just to recap something we discussed in the genetics correct, breakout correct. session. Yeah. Is, oh, it was, why is Asia underrepresented right now? And I think you maybe you can repeat that, Jay, for the whole group. Yeah, well, so as we all know now, like GTEx has only 1.1% representation of Asian, and many international genome consortiums don't have Asian population. Um, so there are a lot of negative implications because uh, if you re refer Western genome uh, to Asian patients, uh, you would be either miss, you miss the whole big picture. So how, I think quantifying that somehow, um, 
it, what are some of the negative repercussions of, of doing this? What is the current uh, limitations and risks? Um, somehow highlighting that in, in this white paper that we've been talking about will be very important to again communicate why, creating the case for why we need more genetic information from Asia, um, but at the same time communicating the benefits to, in, in their own native language. Um, so it's a multi-prong approach of uh, creating what's lacking and what's the risk of that and what could be the benefit of having Asian population representation. So yeah, I, I just want to add to that. Maybe I think something you said, which which I'll just repeat, is that it could be also that there's less funding in Asia for for this kind of basic research. It could be that it's cultural barriers. There's more perhaps suspicion or skepticism about donating your data in Asia. Um, and yeah, I think that goes with uh, public education and creating that awareness. Uh, but regarding funding, um, creating the need uh, in, in the society. And again, funders have to, have to find a, a reason, a justification of how that fund will impact the society in a positive way. Um, and I, I think by highlighting the risks of having this skewed uh, genome information from Western countries can create in their society could be one of the fact one of the reason factors that can persuade some of the funders to consider. By the way, this topic should also be very much uh, relevant in South America or in African countries. So it's more of an equitable question, uh, but hopefully we can take away a lot of things from this meeting and also help other continents, so to speak, to execute these issues. So regarding the genetic data, I have one comment to make. So uh, in Singapore, there is a precision medicine program led by Dr. Patrick Tan. He has just recently published a nature method, a nature paper on that project. So he sequenced the thousands of Singaporean, Malay, Indian, and Chinese, and then maybe we can on to that program and then because he has all the genomic data and then we add on the IC data that will be highly uh, is a is a marriage in heaven in my opinion you're talking about prism hmm? prism oh, no, prism no, no, in, the pre in the heaven the, the prism cohort uh, I'm not sure about the name of the program, but yeah, it's the yeah because I I, I think that we, uh, I discussed with uh, Dr. Tan before, so uh, he encouraged me because I want to look at the immune cells. He in, encouraged me to look at uh, some of his uh, cohort that show already show some uh, mutations in the immune gene, uh, immune related genes. That will be highly uh, relevant to the IDA project. That's a very good idea. Yes, and I've spoken to him. Yeah, he's had similar conversations with me as well. So, yeah, that's a good good suggestion. So, so Japan actually also have huge efforts called Japan Biobank. So they've collected thousands of blood samples across mm -hmm. the population, and they've done genome sequencing. But that was done three, four, five years ago, and of course uh, they have some blood samples that are stored in these vials, but once you thaw them, you cannot do single cell RNA sequencing anymore. So I think that is um, unfortunate timing, but going forward, if there's such uh, biobank exercise or programs in your countries, talking to the program directors early on so that they preserve the samples in a way that they can do single cell RNA sequencing will be an ideal case. The second thing is um, whether you can follow up on some of the individuals where you have sequenced the genomic data. So in Japan, again, uh, it's very difficult in terms of ethics because they did not think about this at the time of sample collection. So it's one of the things that we also discussed about is when you're creating your ethics application, always have follow-up statements because I think there will be greater value to do longitudinal studies or if you just have genomic data, but you, in the future, if you want to collect additional 
RNA-seq data, then you can always find the, find the individual and do this. So um, yeah, that's, we've been asked by the funders, uh, can you work with Japan Biobank? And we tried, but all the samples are useless. So it's really unfortunate. And I think this is a mistake we learned, and hopefully this can be avoided in your countries yeah, or in the future. But this is only PBMCs. So yeah, if you want to do other tissues, that's another story. <laughs> like a biobank. So there's a brain biobank as well in Japan. Um, uh, I was going to move on to the next topic. Well, OK, extend the current topic. So there's increasing representation of Asian data in the HCA. And then there's also a question of increasing equity within Asia. We don't want the Asian data to be just from the wealthy countries or just from the wealthy cities in, in the wealthy countries. So you want to have as diverse participation uh, and sampling as possible. So I, so I just want to bring this topic up front because the default is like you sample genomics researchers <laughs> in your own, I mean, in your own, not, not quite in your own lab, but in your own immediate surroundings or in a hospital, you sample the people working in that hospital and so on. Uh, how do we make efforts to go beyond our immediate surroundings and uh, really profile diverse geography, diverse environmental exposure, diverse genetics within our own countries? Uh, to, to, cap, to fully capture what's going on. And this is not something unique to the single cell field. It's been in psychology studies, there's the same problem. I think they even have an acronym, it's weird, which is Western, educated, something, something, resource rich. So those are the kinds of people who are profiled in psychology studies. It's not, you know, the average person, right? So w what, um, w what can we do? To, to change that bias, right? We're saying, okay, only having European samples is bad because it's biased. You should have Asian samples, but then we come with Asian samples, and if those are also biased, we're not really even staying true to what the statements are, the principles that we are proposing. So, uh, Shui Gong? Equity is a quite important in genetic diversity. However, this for this uh, uh, HCA project uh, on the tissues that are hard to to get the fresh uh, samples. So pro probably at this stage, uh, we should not pay too much attention on say, this diversity uh, because uh, so, uh, it's hard to, to, to really get a sample. It's, a, it's not blood sample, it's a real tissue sample and we are uh, expecting the healthy sample. So, so I, I think the point is that we should try to get uh, say, the distribution of the labs involved, uh, they are kind of uh, try to add as, uh, as a representative as possible. But it's OK that they just uh, uh, collect whatever sample they uh, can access uh, within their region. And this, that's more uh, uh, feasible. Because I, I uh, work uh, with collaborators working on heart transplantation, they have uh, access to those uh, heart uh, transplantations that are rejected uh, because of mismatch. So it's, it's really valuable. You cannot make any choice. It's, you just wait. So, so I, I think if we to, put too much uh, uh, attention on, on this design, it, it will be hard to, uh, per, uh, uh, to make progress. That's uh, just my it's an interesting point. Sometimes you just say, we'll take what samples we can get because it's so hard to get those samples. But, uh, and a point well taken. But it would be nice to balance that with like, certain kinds of samples that are easy to get. Again, let's say PBMCs, for example. Can we at least increase the diversity of, of that? And maybe, Christine, you want to comment on that? Uh, so at the equity meeting in um, Ethiopia, uh, uh, a week or two ago, there was a lot of discussion from low to middle income countries and researchers representing actually good laboratories in countries like Bangladesh, um, Thailand, uh, uh, and other areas where they don't have the wealth that we, we see here in Singapore or in Japan. 
that the um, capacity to uh, do very good science is there, but the capability to do it because of the resourcing available to them and the training available to them is limited. And so programs like the Human Cell Atlas can play a very important role in actually building uh, capability and capacity in those, those countries. It can be a galvanizing and transformative program. So um, I think that we should be bold in setting really um, ambitious targets. We may not meet them, and realistically, that's okay. But if you don't set the targets to say, we will try and include diversity of Asian countries and Asian populations, then of course you will never ever meet those targets at all. Um, and I think it's um, the responsibility of countries within this region who do have um, uh, some resources to provide sponsorship, uh, training and um, mentorship for those uh, researchers to help build up that capability and believe in their capacity to do that research. So certainly my lab in Australia would be very happy to be a participant in some of those training programs and I'm sure there are other labs in the region who are also already doing that. Uh, so we are looking at building uh, an, an indigenous, uh, an Australian indi indigenous genomics uh, contribution to the HCA. Uh, this is going to be a slow um, <laughs> project for a number of reasons, uh, not least we want to avoid the kind of helicopter science that has plagued um, the indigenous Australian communities in the past. We have a very good indigenous genomics program that we're butting into, but the first step is for us is to actually engage indigenous community leaders who may not be scientists to bring them along on the journey. So um, for, for us, there's a very strong will to represent uh, indigenous Australians in this atlas. How, how we go about doing that is something that we still have to resolve as a community. And in a country as large as Australia, there's not one indigenous community. There are actually hundreds of indigenous communities with their own dialect and quite diverse genetics. So this is a, actually a very, very big um, issue. So coming to Shui Gong's point, what kind of sampling do you envision? There will be PBMCs or something else? Uh, well, actually, it's going to differ from community to community because um, body tissues can have quite strong uh, religious um, uh, perspectives. Uh, so we're discovering that, for example, the archival blood samples that we have uh, in our freezers, um, we have thousands of these blood samples. They're currently being repatriated back to country. Um, to the, those indigenous communities because there is a belief from those communities that that blood is holding their ancestor grounded to, to this world and not allowing them to move on to the next world. But strangely, from my perspective, uh, from the Western perspective, they don't care about DNA or RNA. So if in the process of destroying or repatriating that material, we can recover the, the material we want to profile, then um, we, we might be able to find a compromise. But the compromise that works for one community is not going to be the compromise that works for the next. We're also exploring uh, the use of pluripotent stem cells. Uh, again, um, because this is creating a cell type that doesn't exist in the body, it may transcend that community concern. And from their model, at least the lineages um, that we're interested in um, uh, profiling in the human cell atlas, even if they're not from an in vivo context, they're at least going to capture the uh, development versus uh, genetic uh, consideration. Well, great to see that there's such systematic efforts in, in Australia uh, in this direction. Any other countries um, looking at within country diversity uh, in any single cell form? Can just comment on that. So, uh, although Japan is, you know, an affluent country, um, still the, the 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 infrastructure to do single cell RNA sequencing is still not very large. Um, so people are aware of this, and there are people who can do it. 
but um, and I've talked to many clinicians and they are willing to give samples, but they just don't have the right infrastructure to do single cell sequencing and even to analyze the data. Um, and these are clinicians in big cities and also in small cities. Um, so how to create this kind of infrastructure and, and accessibility is, is a lot of effort, um, but the question is, is it, but it is much doable, and, but it requires some effort and, and, and energy to do that. So I just want to, and, and I think by return, you can increase the samples uh, for that country. So how, how can we, um, so I've, I've done this in Japan, and now we, are, which we have about 10 different universities that Weekend is collaborating with to then get samples and do single cell sequencing. Um, and if, it, if similar models, if it can be adopted in, in different countries, um, including low-income countries, uh, so that could you elaborate on what way. exactly the model is? So it's really a win-win model. So what happened in the past is that we would generate the data to clinicians, and they would take the data, and they're too busy to analyze. And uh, they don't really do any follow-up or write papers. Uh, so what we normally do is when we talk to these clinicians, we try to find uh, PIs or researchers who will be interested in the same tissue or the disease. And basically, uh, we, we receive the samples, we generate the single cell data, we return the data to the clinician and the PI, and they can do whatever they want with it. Um, they can write the paper whenever they want. So it's all theirs. Only condition is that their data will be then collected into Weekend, and we will integrate this for global genomic analysis. So as long as they're okay with that, uh, now that we have 10 and adding, you know, plus additional collaborations, uh, we hope to provide data to individual clinicians, but at the same time collect uh, single cell data. And there, some of the healthy, or ideally, all the healthy tissues will be going to global HCA, and some of the disease samples will be then analyzed individually by the PIs. So that's... I, I think that's a very interesting model, and it just goes to show that it doesn't mean if you're a wealthy country, automatically everybody's doing single cell work. Yeah, exactly. uh, the technology is yeah. still very limited in its uh, number of labs that, that do it at the yeah. moment. So I think um, we thought about training these clinicians, but <laughs> they don't have time to do all, all these um, library preparation or data analysis. But they're happy to work with a PI to um, explore the biology and write the paper together. So I think enable, enabling that, um, I think it's critical. Um, uh, I think that's a very, very nice model. Uh, uh, anyone else? So Thailand, is those Ananya from Varadom's lab in Thailand? Is she still here? No? OK. Uh, any, anyone else has comments on diversity, within country diversity, uh, expanding the circle, have more, more groups sampled, more groups participating? So Piero's question is, is Russia part of Asia? <laughs> uh, we have some Russian colleagues here, but not anymore. Yulia is here? No, I think she left. Okay. We did have one or two Russian participants. Um, anyone want to speak about this? Definitely underrepresented in, in many of the genome. thinking like we use, you said South, um, sorry, South, like America as well as Africa and then the Middle East. So what we're going to do. So I think one thing we can do is like, you know, we can talk about this issue maybe in one of the uh, international single cell meetings and like, you know, open the <coughs> topic to discussion and so and hear from other, um, other countries. Yeah. I, think, I think so. Musa actually is here. And he is one of the leaders of Equity Working Group in HCA. <laughs> and he gave a fantastic overview at the Barcelona meeting. And I think he may have some comment or two about <laughs> how to reach 
the equity goals? I think it's, as you say, it's really important to include people from other continents. And, um, and it's funny that you should mention America, I guess South America and Africa, because um, so Jonah is sitting next to me here from the CZI, and I went to, and, and Alex Shalik went to uh, South America, went to um, Brazil in September to kind of do an HCA uh, roadshow to introduce the HCA to Brazil. And, um, and our host for that was um, Lucio Freitas, who um, basically organized a program for us to meet uh, all the people working in closely related fields, as well as opening it to the whole university. Um, there was like an amphitheater like this size, completely full, and another one uh, where they live streamed the entire, you know, I think it was like half a day, uh, where we all presented like different scientific aspects of the HCA. Um, I think Jonah pointed out at that time, I don't know if you want to comment like about applications that come into CZI and how none had ever come from South America. Um, I don't know if you want to say a few words about that, because I think that's, that's really important in terms of what you're saying, because on the one hand, it's, it's one thing to include other people. On the other hand, these RFAs are out there. And, um, you know, the participation in them is, is, is also quite geographically constrained, um, which says a lot about how many people actually know about the HCA. You want to say a few words, Jonah? Or? Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. I mean, so one thing that uh, struck me in the context of that visit and is maybe germane to some of the discussion around equity and training is there were a number of really, really smart and impressive students and postdocs that were reanalyzing data that they were able to get a hold of. And I think, you know, again, for all of us that have the opportunity to make data accessible and then take the time to train and do outreach and build that capacity, it's a really wonderful way to break down those barriers and get a lot of people. I mean, it's, it's super scalable, right? Um, so I think that like, this is one of those things that really resonated for me to see groups that didn't even have a single cell sequencer accessible to them were already starting to analyze and bring that data into their work, which was inspiring. I just, I just want to add like one last thing, which is I think the HCA is, from what I can tell from everything that you know, Jay and Piero have said here from the OC is really committed to trying to diversify and be inclusive in terms of the HCA projects and participation and samples that are, are being used. And um, to that end, we had another really large meeting in Africa just last week um, uh, where we had people from all over Africa um, in a HCA meeting. And I think that meeting was very interesting because it focused very much on equity, very much on how people f want to benefit from the HCA, are interested in making cell atlases that are relevant to their geographies, to their um, primary translational interests. Um, and there were quite a few people, I think, who were there, who are here now, like Chris from Australia, and um, I've seen another one or two other people who were there too. Um, and I think that's really important because it shows again that di very different from the Human Genome Project, the idea here is to use the HCA as an opportunity to train and educate the next generation of scientists, as well as to do a lot of this work in these different parts of the world and include samples from these different parts of the world. So maybe I, one takeaway that I get got from these two comments is: Should we have a roadshow <laughs> in HCA Asia? Um, because I think, as Musa just mentioned, they had roadshow in Brazil and it's very successful and it empowers the local community. And um, perhaps that's something we can take away from this is, as a as a community, if anyone's interested, we form a. I'll get up, get a bus, and we go <laughs> a trip um, to Thailand or you know Malaysia, and have these educational sessions uh, or um, workshops. 
So I think I think this discussion of diversity is really fascinating, and the idea of having a con uh, uh, these this kind of uh, three tri trip that Jay is proposing maybe maybe help. I would like to say something. So just today and today we were talking very much about spatial transcriptomics. It's very important to know where the cells are positioned and understand uh, understand them this way so that you can you can really understand the complexity of the 3D. I think with populations it's the same thing because populations have been moving all all around the world for a long time. And then one of the things that we're trying to do in our consortium is try to profile the 52 different ethnic groups in China. And they extend over a very vast territory with very different genetic contributions because of population movements for thousands of years. So we could do the same thing with the Asian Pacific region and extend into other parts of the world, Africa, and then European populations that are much more similar with each other. Then I think we might get much closer to understand what uh, disease means, how it appears, what's the contribution of the genome, what's the contribution of the environment, what everything comes together, and then uh, this would be uh, fantastic. Can you share a bit of your experience of how you're planning to achieve the collection of 50 different ethnic groups in China, and what are your plans going forward? Okay, so uh, at the China National Bank, we have experience on doing uh, genome projects uh, massively uh, with hundreds of thousands, and we're planning with uh, much, larger, uh, much larger capability. So we have contacts in all these different regions, but in the end, obviously, it takes, like you were saying, get on a bus or on a plane or even on a camel and go elsewhere and then try to get the people engaged into uh, getting these cohorts, and then uh, we just sequence them and then sequence the camel. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think, again, the takeaway is that additional action and, 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 and interest and energy is required, but, and, but it's ultimately very much worth it to, to do this. Actually, you mentioned training. Oh, Chris, did you have something to add? Look, um, the Human Cell Atlas and Human Cell Atlas Asia is a wonderful crowdsourcing activity, but it's a fairly toothless tiger without having some means to incentivize inclusion of different groups. Um, but I did wonder whether we could advocate for some policy changes within the main HCA Atlas builds and also within uh, to editors of papers to say that if um, a, an atlas, a tissue atlas is being generated and submitted for publication that does not include representation from non-Europeans that it should not be considered complete and should not be published. And let's actually be really bold about that, that in order to address this equity, strong policy needs to be put into play and that policy needs to be advocated from this community. That is, it's, a, it's a bold one. Yes, I agree. Uh, it's sometimes bold steps are necessary. Um, and I think we have to be careful make, making sure that um, you know there's this terminology genome colonialism. Um, so if that implementation is required, I'm afraid someone just would take the samples and sequence everything at the Broad or the Sanger and, and publish. And that's the last thing we want to happen as well. So. I think you're right, we need to have a bold steps, but it's gonna take time because we have to start training these in the, uh, the groups in these countries. And I think it would take much more um, effort to, to generate the data from these regions. But we need to make, go towards that direction at some point. Yeah. 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 So I was gonna propose the the carrot uh, side of that stick, which was so, if, uh, you know, so Miguel mentioned a very exciting initiative across China. You, you mentioned something in Australia. And we're trying to do something over here as well. Uh, well. Hopefully, people in this room will take away that equity is a very important goal of the HCA. Uh, Everyone's talking about it. Journal editors will hear that. And so if you orient your research towards equity, uh, you will have a good chance to publish papers. And hopefully, hopefully that can be an incentive for um, 
a positive incentive for, for people to think slightly differently about uh, the kind of research they do in, in the single cell field. Well, just I wanted to add to Christine's like comment, like whether we should just I think we should be careful about that, not to impede the speed of like, you know, uh, medical research. And because it, it is going to take us to for us to come up with answers and like, you know, we still need like in you know, a lots of development in technology. So we shouldn't like, you know, slow down the progress like by requiring you have to have like, you know, everything in there like, you know, uh, in, a, in a publication. So I think just like, you know, we, we have to be careful that because like, you know, if you look at the like really interesting ideas, they're not coming from big papers, all these like, you know, Nobel Prize winning like, you know, ideas that took like, you know, medical research or the health research or like technologies are actually done in small studies. Sometimes like, you know, you have to, I think, focus on like, you know, a little like a population or study or I don't know. So that's like, I think it's another perspective that we should keep in mind. Excellent point. Uh, I think the poster child for the HCA is a pulmonary ionocyte, which gets mentioned at every HCA meeting, I think. Uh, I just mentioned it at this one. So, uh, and you know, it may have been sufficient to profile one ethnicity to discover that cell type and it was useful. Uh, so yeah, there, there is a balance certainly, but I do think it's important to have some kind of high level policy uh, backing equity. Uh, and then to balance the kind of bottom up things that we're trying to do and the incentives and so on. I uh, want to come back to something Jay mentioned, which is training. So, and I've been in other discussions also outside the HCA were not related to the HCA directly, where everyone says we need training. I think here it's also very clear we need training. Um, how do we make that happen? How do we incentivize people to do tra spend their time on training rather than spending time publishing papers? I, I think we need, the first thing we need is a very affordable and accessible technology. Um, and unfortunately, 10x is not the most <laughs> ideal case because it's expensive. Unless, unless HCA or equity team have a separate agreements with these industry partners to provide special discounts or whatnot, um, I think we do need to consider what are the technologies that can be accessible. So I think, yeah, uh, microwells or from Alex Shalak and, and Goji also have used are you know, it's relatively cheap compared to, say, job-based approaches. And, and, and then the question is how to standardize this in a, in a global fashion. So I think technology is, and accessibility to that um, is probably the first thing that we need to decide on. Um, I think also McGill and um, BGI also showed this thing that you pulled out of your pocket um, <laughs> where you can actually generate droplets from your, po you know, from your hand. Um, so such type of methods could also be um, considered and be able to disseminate this as widely as possible. M Musa, do you, you want to jump in? How, how do we, so you, so you and Alex very generously flew to Brazil and you know, participated in some training, but how, how do you, what, what's, this, what's the plan or strategy for getting training in Asia or outside Asia more, more, more broadly. It won't always be people like you just deciding to do it on your own initiative and just spend your time, right? How do we, how do we get mo more training done? Um, yeah, I think we didn't really do it on our own initiative that way. I, I guess I kind of presented it like that, but it's, it's, it was a bit more um, structured than that. So. Um, this is all part of a roadmap that we have put forward for um, to the HCA for how to get equity and diversity into into the whole HCA program, and um, so we have two roadshows planned for the new year. Um, and uh, as Jay mentioned a few minutes ago, I think it's important to do roadshows in parts of Asia that don't get exposed to this. So the roadshow is more like what we did in Brazil, 
uh, with uh, Jonah, and it's really to expose the local community to, to the HCA. Um, and, and I think uh, Jade did something similar in Japan, actually, um, that resulted in you know, many clinicians getting involved in, in the HCA. So you can see the benefits from this. So we have one plan for the first half of next year in, uh, in Southeast Asia, and another one planned for uh, West Africa and East Africa in, uh, in the second half of the year. So those are, that's kind of a general overview. I think more concretely, the way we see this is firstly a roadshow and secondly having practical training workshops within these uh, kind of, I don't want to call them excluded areas of the world, but in, in these parts of the world that are not you know, deeply participating in HCA. And, um, and for that, we've tr got a lot of support from Welcome Trust to be able to use some of their centers in different parts of the world to as nucleating points for this. And, um, and we've also got a bit of support from, from the CZI to, to be able to, to do these sort of workshops. And then the third thing we're trying to do is have labs that are in the HCA to really, and this is something I asked in Barcelona, try to give your expertise to support postdocs and students to come to your lab who may need to learn some of these techniques that they don't have in their parts of the world. And so um, I think these are all things that are very replicatable in Asia. I think Asia is, is, is further ahead in this than South America or Africa. And so um, these three components, I think, are going to be really important because they also target a specific tranche. They actually target the people who are generating data, the people who can get data to participate in the seed project. And I know we've had a bit of polemics on how to enforce diversity, but one of the ways to do that is, first of all, to upskill people who would get involved in the HCA. And also there's a pool me or carrot mechanism, which is some of the grants that can be given for seed networks or collaborative networks should, can be kind of like human frontiers grants where they have to involve one partner who's from one um, like less advantaged area of the HCA. And I think that those mechanisms, they may not enforce you know, diversity as fast as we like, but we do it in a way where we really are confident of the skills of the people who are getting involved. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the road shows. I'd forgotten about that, actually. Um, how do we get those road shows in, uh, in Asia? How do we find the people and the funding? Look, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of positive energy here these last two days. Um, I think there's some people, um, you've had a lot of commercial sponsors who, who've supported this meeting. Um, I think they're new commercial sponsors in Southeast Asia who are also involved in single cell biology who would very much like to get involved. Um, I don't want to speak on anyone's behalf here, but um, there are definitely some who also develop technologies like 10X technologies that could become available to more resource constrained areas. So there's that to look at. Um, and I also think that um, one of the things, and this is just maybe parenthetical, but one of the things that happened in Brazil was um, we met the largest uh, foundation for science funding in South America. We met with the leadership and they were so excited about the HCA that they pledged to support new funding for the HCA in the kind of co-funding model. And one of the things about having a roadshow, you get sort of the credibility of the HCA organization that may help to open doors locally to the funding agencies and make them aware of the Human Cell Atlas, which may change, slightly tweak the funds that they have already and make them available for HCA-specific calls. And I think, for example, in South Africa, we've kind of taken these small grants that are for postdocs and students in precision medicine and made them like building atlases in, in pediatric gliomas, for example, at single cell attack resolution. And, um, and that's sort of like a little bit of pilot funding which we've kind of repurposed from its original thing to, 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 for, to build data sets that can be used in future collaborative networks. So I, I think we have to kind of bootstrap a little bit in areas where 
there's no specific funding allocated or 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 lobby for thanks Musa uh, should we move on to the next topic uh, okay we, we uh, next topic was going to be uh, okay very broadly beyond Ida what is the next ACA Asia collaborative transnational project uh, and I think the Cancer breakout discussion has already answered one of those that question in one sense. Uh, so the first question is, what what will be a Asian cancer project? Uh, maybe we don't need to repeat that; it's already been presented. So we'll move on to the question after that. So let's say one we already have either for PBMCs, and I'll just say very quickly it would be you know lovely to expand either to various aspects of immunology uh, beyond PBMC, so tissue resident immune cells and in, in sort of just healthy, healthy PBMCs, PBMCs and various diseases and so on. Uh, but let's say we... Can I comment on that? So I, I guess the question that we wanted to have is um, how can we bring the community together in Asia and we can talk about these ideas, but if you can centralize these ideas into a flagship project and get people who are interested in these flagship projects to come together and work on a collaborative project together, can we then mobilize these projects into a greater <coughs> actionable uh, plan? And I think AIDA was exactly that example of a uh, flagship project. The first two years of HC Asia meeting, we were just talking, talking, and then we finally got together and wrote the grant together and we received funding for this. So how can we uh, expand this kind of examples to other biological questions uh, and create this new additional flagship projects in Asia? And hopefully many of you here could come together and create a new flagship project together. And one of them is, I think cancer was being discussed quite extensively uh, due to its relevance uh, in the region and perhaps what other flagship projects could be f feasible um, in this group, in this community. And aging, that's a very good point, yes. Okay, done. <laughs> um, maybe Aki or Piero want to comment on this since he has some aging. I don't, I don't know, how many super centenarians do you have in your country? <laughs> um, but yeah. 140, 130, 140 in Japan, plus minus, the, uh, yeah, uh, the uh, super centenarian, but uh, those that you can track uh, and they agree to, to, to be in the study is uh, usually a small number. And we, we just age faster, so <laughs> study is much easier. <laughs> groups, you can realize that they get old in different ways, the bones or the heart. So I think you don't need to go to streams. It would be fantastic to get the centenarians. We should, but we might learn new things from them. And from the normal people, just 70, you know, I think we could learn a lot. Absolutely. Different ethnic groups, and then this could be part of this whole diversity initiative. And then maybe by comparing all of them all over the world, first in Asia, because that's what we're doing, then, you know, we might get ways make people live longer, right? Yeah. Excellent point. I think all, all age ranges looking at aging. But uh, yeah, that's a great suggestion. It, it is broad. Uh, so, um, and I guess just by nature of data collection in HCA, and hopefully everyone will put in input the age of the individuals, you can extrapolate perhaps and, and model the aging um, I guess that's kind of one of the goals of having DCP. Uh, but I guess to your question is how can we explicitly study aging uh, or more focus uh, on aging? Um, and it was a, it's a difficult thing because every cell in the body goes through different <laughs> aging processes. So, um, so immunity, yes. So brain, good point, okay. Brain. If you live too long, you're gonna decline. 
Mm -hmm. How about um, like brain organoids? Is that of interest? Um, I mean, IPS is ra rather obtainable, yet um, it's not. How do you model aging on organoids? It's a completely different discussion. Um, but it is feasible to make brain organoids. <laughs> is it? I mean, can, can, how can we access the IPS banks? Are there IPS banks, um, cell banks already available? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> correct, correct, yeah. But, but can we extend that? Let's say we're not talking about aging, but sure. just given that tissue banks are so difficult in Asia, let's just do compare organoids across the genetics of organoids. So how in accessible... non-aging, non-aging How context. accessible, how many of you have access to IP, IPSL banks in your country? I mean, this is a technology that can be roboticized fairly readily, um, particularly if you don't mind um, how mixed or pluripotent the populations that you generate are. You can build village models, which means that you are pooling donors into one differentiation experiment uh, and using the smart um, EQTL approaches that have been developed to deconvolute who the donors are in a dish. This has the advantage of harmonising batch-to-batch variation. And you can see not aged, mature cell types, but you can see lineage-specific effects, which I think, I think that there is great possibility there, actually. Exactly. So I think you're touching the demultiplexing strategy could also be done in IPS. Yeah, I think yes. that this is a highly scalable model. Um, At a relatively low cost. Relatively yeah. low cost, yeah. Lots of bang Very interesting suggestion. So we have aging, we have organoids, cancer. Fetal. Sorry? Fetal. fetal. How, how is it? How accessible is fetal tissues in Singapore? I don't know. <laughs> okay. You suggested it. <laughs> Highly regulated and restricted. Well, I mean, it should be. <laughs> it should be regulated and restricted. <laughs> Apparently, so Japan is also accessible. Yes. So um, that's something that we can also think about. Because there's already a lot of developmental tissues in, in DCP, mainly from UK, Sweden, France. Actually, we are highly restricted for the, the stem cell or some embryonic research. Indeed. So no bank for the embryonic tissue. No bank for? I mean, for embryonic, I mean, tissues or oh, the fetal, fetal tissues. Right. Yeah. How, how about banking IPS cells? Like, uh, Probably there is a, the, all the project is IPS in Korea be separated, so it's not centralized so many Many of them, they have their own IPS for tissue-specific manner. It's going to be another, another the, the interesting yeah, topic. Yeah, I, I think there are efforts in various places to look at the single cell genetics of IPS cell differentiation. If I'm not mistaken, I heard about somebody proposing that in Barcelona. Uh, and that is something certainly we could would benefit from genetic diversity. And, you know, it's it's not a fetal sample, it's an IPS differentiation, but it can shed light on developmental processes, potentially, and how they vary with, uh, with genetics. If you're considering the translation aspects, then you also have a platform for drug screening. Um, so there are a lot of advantages of thinking about uh, using a pluripotent stem cell model uh, for getting at uh, the genetics. Okay.
Okay, great. So I think we're getting close to time. So, so. No, just yeah, I don't know if, if there's more room for discussion or if everyone's getting tired. <laughs> well, no, we, we uh, I think we we covered all the topics on the list. So, a, any last thoughts? Um, anyone? Are we going to summarize? Are we going to to, to summarize the conclusions and? You're uh, write the white paper. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, to, uh, I just want to be sure that, that we follow up on the decisions. That is not. Is, I mean, it's a good discussion. It's a fantastic good discussion, but uh, we we follow up. That is the most difficult thing, you know, in all of this kind of meeting. Okay. So. Absolutely. So I, I would say this was the key session, really, from the workshop part, which is what are we going to do together? And uh, I think we have some people who have suggested some ideas. We will be following up with you on these specific topics to say, okay, who really wants to raise their hand and actually do the work and form a flagship HC Asia project in such and such an area? Perhaps we'll just send an email out to all the people who registered, uh, inviting participation, and then something can coalesce. Any other last thoughts? So the HCA project will generate a lot of data. And I think that this kind of data might be interesting to the data company, AI company. They may have their own way to to mine it or to package it or to uh, to present it to uh, uh, bring up a bigger value from the data. And this value might be economically uh, uh, impactful. Yeah, so maybe some at a certain point of time, you can invite those company like very good at uh, AI, very good at data science. Maybe they can also put some money there their resources, their money onto this um, this uh, project because the data would be very, very big. Yeah. So. Very good suggestion. We're already talking to some companies to see if, how they can participate. But I, I think that's a great way to scale up. And it's not just about the money also. The companies companies have expertise sometimes we don't have. And so it it's, uh, works very well. I, I think there it's um, that we always use GTEx as an example. There's a very bad example, right? So then, you know, it's really 90% versus 1%. Okay, but if you think about what is the reasonable scope of like equity that we should be aiming for, I think if we take the thousand genome project as an example, right? So that that might be a a, a better like goal that we want to achieve to cover these major populations rather than that um, talking about maybe okay 50 um, minority ethnic group in China so that's that, that's fine but as, as, a, as a local Chinese you know a minority ethnic study but as an Asian or as a for example like more global XCA so I think the scope of the equity or the diversity has to be like more well defined okay rather than like chasing to this like corner, like really, really minority. So then I think the thousand genome project would maybe a good model that, that we could go after in terms of diversity. Yeah, so like um, Asian thousand genomes, so trillion cells. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I guess, uh, we have some concrete directions and we'll definitely be following up and that's the most valuable part of uh, an HCA Asia meeting. I uh, want to an announcement about next year. So, um, one of Miguel, Shui Gong. So, uh, Guoji has already left. So, we, uh, Miguel and me, probably make the announcement. So, it has been decided that uh, Next year's HC uh, Asia meeting will be happen uh, in China, probably in Hangzhou. Uh, it's not finalized yet, so uh, Guo Ji, uh, myself, and uh, Miguel will will work together on that. Uh, and uh, uh, the time will be approximately around this uh, season, so November or October. So 
I think there is a Cold Spring Harbor uh, Asia single cell genomics meeting. Yeah, we Asia, need to check uh, with the, around that yeah, time the schedule of uh, yeah. So any, uh, so just uh, uh, be prepared <laughs> and welcome to, 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 to China. Yeah. I, I would like to add one thing. So um, yeah, the meeting will be towards the end of the year. And then that means that we have a whole year to pick up all these very important discussions that we had, including those of equity and diversity, uh, to, to, to discuss them more, more thoroughly uh, when, when, when we meet there. So uh, I, think, I think this will be very important, because if not, it's like catch, catching up things from scratch. And then uh, we, we get into that vicious circle and things don't move on. So I would suggest that we really have a very intense email communication and even visits between people so that we get some of these things done. I'll be very happy to interact more with Singaporean people, Australian, or uh, any, any, anybody. And then uh, I would like to add that any, any uh, uh, ethnic group, it doesn't matter, big or small, they're equally important. I think that's something that we should not forget. I, I think, yeah, in this meeting, form quite a few connections, and we should keep those up. So thank you for the announcement. Looking forward to uh, China next year. And so that's, that brings, up, brings us to the end of this meeting. Uh, thank you all for uh, participating, staying through the whole thing, and uh, looking forward to new flagship projects and more Asian representation in HCA. Thank you. Can we... Okay. Can we also thank Shyam for hosting us for this wonderful meeting and the team, yeah. all the team over here in the Mala and others. So thank you. Yeah. Well, okay, so are you reminding me? There's more thank yous. To go. <laughs> so thank you, Wong Yang. Thank you, Jay. So thanks, Jay, for, and Piero for setting the whole ball rolling in Okinawa two years ago with HC Asia. And I was like, it was kind of a curious idea, and it's gained so much momentum now. As you can see, and uh, Sun Young hosted the next meeting, you know, 2018 ACA Asia meeting, now Singapore, then China, and the circle keeps, uh, keeps expanding. Um, and uh, I really want to thank uh, Nirmala uh, so, uh, on the organizing committee, and Winnie and Lynn, who are not here right now. Uh, but they really did the serious, you know, the bulk of the work for this meeting. And uh, uh, we are very lucky at the GIS to have people who have experience organizing conferences. And uh, it's, it's helped us immeasurably. Uh, we've thanked the sponsors again. Uh, we've thanked the sponsors already, but you know, they, they, were, uh, they were essential to covering, uh, you know, m making this possible. Uh, who else? Eh? And I think that's it. So thank you again. <laughs>